Hello, this is a British Psychological Society audio interview. I'm Wendy Barnaby, and I'm joined by Sophie Scott, Professor of Cognitive Neuroscience at University College London. And Sophie, we're going to be talking about your research into laughter. We all think of laughter. You laugh when something's funny, when you're amused, but it turns out not to be like that. Exactly. So I went into this thinking it was about amusement. We were calling it amusement. Um, And then we came across research from uh, Robert Provine in the US, and Robert Provine has shown very strikingly that if you ask adult humans when do you laugh, what makes you laugh, they will talk about comedy, they'll talk about humour, they'll talk about jokes. If you look at when they laugh, they laugh when they're with their friends. You laugh when you're having a conversation with somebody that you know, maybe that you like, who you'd like to like you. It can be associated with humour and amusement, but actually its primary role is a social affiliative emotion where you're expressing affection and agreement as much as amusement. So it's forming social bonds. It seems to be a very efficient way of forming and maintaining social bonds. And even just sort of Robert Provine says that laughter is a good way of showing I, I mean you no harm. I was sitting on a train a few weeks ago at the start of quite a long journey up to the north of England and there was a woman who'd got a double seat all to herself and right at the last minute two men came and joined her and she said to them, I'm sorry I'm going to have to move you've both got coffee and I don't like the smell of coffee. But what she did was she said the whole thing with an enormous amount of laughter, which made them laugh. And what could have been a really quite aggressive interaction, saying, I I don't want to sit with you for the next three hours, was actually managed with great skill. And I thought that's very interesting because the primary way they've done that is with the laughter. And I bet none of them, if you asked them afterwards, would remember that that's actually what had happened. It's such an automatic kind of level at which to engage, which really reduces aggressive aspects of, of potentially aggressive situations. And so one of the things I've been very struck by is some really nice work from Robert Levinson in the US, and he uses classic polygraph recordings. So he's using, you know, measures of galvanic skin response and heart rate and all other things that sort of change with your emotional state. He's wiring people up in this way, and he's doing them in couples. He's taking married couples, and then he's asking them to discuss something which he knows will lead to conflict. So he'll say, tell me something that your husband does that irritates you. And you see, you're forced to talk about something which is going to be uncomfortable to talk about. And you can see in the polygraph recordings people's stressful responses increasing. What's very striking is that he's finding that the couples who manage that change in stress with what he calls positive affect, but it's laughter, are the people who not only immediately sort of get on top of those unpleasant sensations and have a, you know, and sort of deal immediately with the conflict better, but also are the people who stay together for longer. So if we can take longevity of a relationship as some sort of index of the strength of that relationship, I think what it's saying is laughter is not just something you kind of emit to say, oh, I like you. We actually use it in relationships and interactions within those relationships as a way of managing where the kind of emotional state of that interaction is. You distinguish between voluntary laughter and involuntary laughter. Can you tell me what you mean by those and why the distinction is important? It's important in some ways and not in others, but the main distinction is between an emotional state which is being induced in somebody in an involuntary way. So if something makes you laugh and you perhaps don't even want to laugh, or you certainly couldn't stop producing that vocalisation, I would consider that to be an involuntary laugh. The classic examples I use when I'm giving talks are newsreaders trying to do live radio broadcasts and something makes them laugh and they can't control it. The famous Um, cricket example. Exactly, that's a perfect example. Um, Even the more recent one with James Nocte mispronouncing Jeremy Hunt's name. I mean, he keeps talking, but he sounds as if he's having a fight with somebody. He's so struggling with the effect that the laughter's having on on the way that he's breathing and it's affecting his speech. That's what I'd consider to be involuntary laughter, and I'm contrasting it with voluntary laughter, which is laughter you more deliberately choose to join in with, and I think a lot of social laughter falls into that class. So a lot of the times when you're laughing with your friends, you are choosing to do so. It's not a bad thing or a wrong thing, but it's, it's a qualitatively different way of laughing. It's more like the speech that you're producing. You're, you're choosing to do this thing. But you're using it, and it's received in a way of indicating, I'm giving you my very positive social sign that I like you and I agree with you and I'm part of the same group as you and all that. And just because I stop laughing like this rather than continuing helplessly laughing doesn't negate that. And as far as the brain goes... It's different bits of the brain that control voluntary and involuntary laughter. What we've been looking at is what happens when you listen to voluntary and involuntary laughter. And we are finding quite interesting differences in that when you, when you hear 
voluntary laughter and this is a study where we didn't tell people it was a study of laughter and we didn't tell them there were two different sorts of laughs in there and we previously just done whatever it took to make people laugh so we had good recordings of genuine involuntary laughter and voluntary laughter from those same people what we find is that you get a lot more auditory cortex activation to the involuntary laughter probably reflecting the fact that actually in involuntary laughter you force sound out through your larynx and your, all your sort of articulators under such incredibly high pressures, you get sounds that you essentially could not make voluntarily and really, really high pitches, whistling sounds. Um, and I think you get more auditory cortex activation in recognition of the fact that there's a whole set of sounds that you don't normally encounter. Frequently, often much, much quieter, so it wouldn't be unusual to get sort of <laughs> sounds going on in real helpless mirth. So there's actually a lot less there than if somebody's going, ha, ha, ha. In contrast, what you find in the voluntary laughter is more activation. And just bear in mind, people are just listening to these and they don't know there's two different sorts of laughs in there. They get more activation in medial prefrontal areas associated with mentalisation and social processing. So when you hear somebody producing a laugh which is clearly voluntary, like a ha 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 ha, you are trying to work out why that person's laughing. If you're hearing a helpless laughter, that's completely unambiguous, you know what's going on there. If somebody does a <laughs> then you know there's a reason why they produced it and you're trying to work out why. Even if you're having a brain scan, which is phenomenally un- uninteresting in terms of the sort of mirthful qualities. So I think, I think that speaks to the importance of it as a social cue. You're, when you hear laughter, you're trying to work out why the person's laughing. Has your research affected the way you laugh? I think the, my research has made me think a lot more about laughter. <laughs> Um, it hasn't stopped me laughing, and uh, it hasn't stopped me worrying when I hear people doing pose laughing, because I know, you know it's a positive sign. If people are choosing to try and emit this sound around you, it's not a bad thing. What it has made me realise is a lot of how we attribute laughter to qualities of people. So we'll say, oh, you know, I love so-and-so, he's got a brilliant sense of humour, and I realise what we mean is, I really like so-and-so, and I laugh when I'm with him to show that I like him. And I think that the opposite is also true. So I've noticed people who I've sort of... I've always thought, oh, they laugh really inappropriately. You know, I'm just going about my business and they're going, oh, ha, 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 ha. what's all that about? And I've realised what it is, is that I don't join in. So I attribute the laughter being wrong to them, but actually the person who's wrong is me because I'm not joining in with it. Well, you're, you're not, responding not responding to the cues they're responding to. I'm actually withholding it. So I think the interesting thing there is that you, we always interpret that as being something about their laughter being wrong, but actually it's our response to that laughter. And it's basically me saying, oh, I don't think we have that kind of relationship. You're not getting that laughter out of me. You know, it's, it's, actually, it's quite a shining, quite a bright light on the fact that I simply don't like them. And I interpret it as that as being something to do with them, but actually it's my response to them that's the thing I should be noticing. So I think it's sort of starting, it's making me a little bit psychotic about laughter perhaps in that respect, but it's... I think that's very interesting and I think it kind of speaks to our massive mismatch between how important laughter is to us and how long we spend learning about it and how closely we listen to it being quite sort of separate from our conscious thoughts about laughter which is that it's to do with humour and people you know having good senses of humour. At one level we know it's affiliative and we know it's friendly but we don't express it when we talk about it in that way. Our cultural understanding of laughter is one built around comedy and humour so I think it's, it's a very interesting mismatch. Sophie, thank you very much. Thank you.